Today we have Professor Sheila Misra as our guest for the talk. She is a retired professor of geoarchaeology and a uh, of the Department of Archaeology, Deccan College, Pune. And she has almost 30 years of experience in working in the Asurian studies in India. And uh, she has contributed a number of research articles in this field. So ma'am, actually, what are the significance of this Asurian uh, sites in understanding the early human um, in India? Yeah, so when we look in Indian prehistory, which is like before history, where we use archaeology to find out about the past. And archaeology is material objects, things you can touch. So it was more than 150 years ago when scientists, geologists, paleontologists, they actually uh, came to the conclusion that there are some stones which are actually ancient tools. So this recognition that there are stone tools that represent some part of the human past that happened, it kind of got accepted around 1858. There was a big meeting in France and the Geological Survey of India was founded in the same year and they had all these officers and one of them was Robert Bruce Foote and he immediately in his explorations in Tamil Nadu he immediately recognized some of these stone tools. And so this was like, so the whole recognition of stone tools in India, it was not very far beyond, be, uh, behind the recognition of similar things in Europe. So Robert Bruce Foote found these stone tools in quaternary sediments in Tamil Nadu. And I think it was two or three years ago, we, we celebrated 150 years of uh, that discovery. So this was only a few years after the beginning of the, I mean, the Geological Survey of India. So these, Bruce Foot immediately uh, correlated them to what was found in Europe. And this was called Echelian, after the site where this whole thing was accepted in France. Now, for a long time, like, Robert Bruce Wood in all his explorations throughout his career in India and even after retirement he continued to work. He actually only divided between the, the you know, he called it uh, Paleolithic. Paleolithic and Neolithic. There was just like two phases for him. And the Paleolithic was considered to be Acheulean. So right from uh, the beginning of the study of stone tools on a global scale, India was part of this. And this was the Acheulean. Now, what is the significance of Acheulean in India? For a long time, it's just like kind of all right. It's like Europe. But in the last like 50 years, it has been found out that the Acheulean in Europe is like much later, much later than the Acheulean in Africa. And the, the, the people working in Africa were always uh, like hesitant about whether it's really the same thing as the Acheulean in Europe. So I think it's actually, it's actually around 1980s only that there was some dating of Acheulean in Africa. And they were actually quite zapped, quite surprised to find that the Acheulean in Africa is as old as 1.6, 1.8, it's 18 lakh years old. This is the oldest. Surprisingly, in Europe, the oldest in Northern Europe where all this actually came together, it was only around four to five hundred thousand years means only around four to five lakhs. So you have an enormous time gap between Acheulean in Europe and Acheulean in Africa. So people really were thinking that, you know, they're the same thing. They, they didn't think that they had such a big uh, difference in age. So they thought that the differences between the Acheulean in Europe and what was close to Acheulean in, in Africa was actually just because they were different places. But the dating showed it was different times. So now the thing is, like, is Indian Acheulean like Africa or is it like Europe? So it is definitely like Africa. And I think that um, really, so we have introduced a new kind of terminology. We call it large flake Acheulean. So it's really got very little similarity to European Acheulean. But I don't, I didn't really want to drop the Acheulean from it because I do think it has evolved from the Indian and African Acheulean. So I do think it's connected. But there are like major differences. There's actually very little in common. So this um, 
Acheulean in India, we have much less dating than, than Africa, much less dating than Europe. We have maybe half a dozen sites which have any dating at all. So actually this makes it more surprising and more like um, interesting that uh, even with just this very few dates, one of the dates from this site of Atirampakkam, which is in fact one of the sites discovered, one of the first sites discovered, the one reported by, um, I mean Robert Bruce Wood, the first discovery was at Palavram and the second one was just a few, maybe a month later or some days later was Atirampakkam. So this site has dated to as early as Africa. So they have about a 10 meter sequence of getting these uh, actually this artifacts at Atarampakam. And the dates are actually ranging from older to Africa. They're actually, their oldest dates are older than the oldest dates in Africa. The youngest ones are younger and the average is younger. So the idea that the Acheulean uh, of, then there are a number of other sites, like all the sites which have actually been studied with paleomagnetism, they all show reversal, which means that they're all more than 800,000 years old. And I think that probably the Eshulin in India really spans the lower Pleistocene. And when we come to middle Pleistocene, which is the boundary between middle and lower Pleistocene is around 8 lakhs, around 800,000 years, we're already like getting to the end of the Eshulin. And I think by 500,000 years, Acheulean is over in India. So to come back to your question about the significance, India is one of the areas where this Acheulean is present throughout the lower Pleistocene. And we have very uh, few fossils, very few fossil hominid remains. And the one that we have is not really associated with Acheulean, it's probably later. So this entire phase, is associated with witch hominin. Now I have argued in an article that it must be Homo erectus. And this comes to another of like you know one of the basic things, one of the kind of toolkit which you have an archaeologist. Uh, as an archaeologist you know we're looking at survival of very little evidence. So this little evidence uh, how do you interpret when you have no evidence? So, you know, they, uh, the, the famous way they say it is like, when is absence of evidence, evidence for absence? Well, the answer to that is never, never. You can only interpret, you can only make some conclusion from something that you do have. But the thing is, that the things you do have are 100% proof of something that you don't have. So you don't actually need the entire tiger to say there's a tiger. One small hair of the tiger is enough. That hair cannot exist without the tiger. So I am using that kind of a reasoning to say that there is a there is an association between Homo erectus and Acheulean. Now the thing is in Java, they have more than 400 fossils of Homo erectus and they keep finding more. And every time I meet some Indonesian uh, archaeologist, they sort of say, oh, have, you know, you haven't found any fossils yet, but you know, we haven't, we haven't. And we have been looking for more than uh, 150 years. So the, you might find one, but it's, I wouldn't put my research problem on that because it's going to be quite tough. There must be some reason why we're not finding them. On the other hand, the Indonesian colleagues, they have almost no artifacts with the, issue, with the Homo erectus. In fact, one Australian archaeologist even wrote a paper that maybe Homo erectus in Java was bereft of tools. So I think that this has to do with what survives and what doesn't survive. Now the thing is that the Homo erectus in Java is associated with animals, fossils of animals, which are most closely related to the Indian Shivalik fauna. And, and there is a difference between the Indian fauna and the China, Chinese fauna. This animals associated with Homo erectus did not get there from China, they got there from India. So it just, uh, you know, it just makes sense that the, the type of human associated with the Indian fauna in Java is the type of human that was in India. I think it's inescapable that Homo erectus reached Java from India. So even if we never, even in future, get Homo erectus in India, I have no doubt that 
Homo erectus made the Acheulean tools in India. Now the thing is like if Homo erectus made Acheulean tools in India, then uh, where did this whole thing originate? And when we come to Africa, we get much earlier tools, lots of fossils. But in all the sites in East Africa and South Africa, North Africa, there is it's actually the appearance of Homo erectus, which they are calling Homo ergatzer and Acheulean technology. They happen at the same time and they happen everywhere at once. And they overlap with the pre-existing fossil humans and artifacts. So it just, I mean, what is that? That is evidence that this transition did not happen in Africa. And if it did not happen in Africa, then where else could it happen? So I think it happened in India, but there is a possibility maybe it happened in Java. So I, 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 I think that Java and India really have to be considered as one when we're looking at the lower Pleistocene. Uh, the fauna, uh, so what we see in the Java record is it's a kind of filtered, um, filtered migration, like all the animals in India couldn't reach there. But some, most of them, so the initial animals that, so Java was actually, didn't exist in the pre, before the lower Pleistocene, that was ocean. So they have the marine sediments, and then they get the terrestrial sediments. And in the very first one, the animal they get is Stegodon and some, uh, some giant tortoise related to the Shivalik ones. There's no Homo erectus. But after this, the next, almost one of the first ones after elephants and tortoise, which can both swim very well, is Homo erectus. And then you get, uh, you know, different kind of deer, the red tigers, um, but you don't get horse. So all the animals couldn't, uh, that were in India couldn't get there. Some of them got there. And then afterwards, uh, there begins to develop some differences between the animals in Java and the ones in India. So that means that now it's a kind of, there's an evolution going on separately. There's no longer an interconnection. Now this connection is because the South China Sea is a very shallow sea. And at periods of lower sea level, in fact, only 15 or 20 meters lower sea level, you can walk from India to Java. And if it's a bit lower than that, then you have, a, the, you have something that they call Sunda land, which is um, the whole exposed continental shelf of the South China Sea. And this is uh, in, in, in area, it's equal in size to the entire Indian subcontinent. So I feel that there is a kind of buffering, like this whole Southeast Asia is a kind of buffering to Indian subcontinent because the lower sea level, this land becomes available when the climate is arid during an ice age. So the arid climate would be, uh, you know, maybe unfavorable in India. Uh, the point is that I think um, we have a lot of absent evidence, a lot of, a lot of evidence is missing. So we never know that something is really missing or we just don't find it or it didn't survive. The thing is that the things that do survive, what do they impl imply about what's missing? So we can never say anything. If we don't have evidence, we cannot say anything about it. We cannot have any scientific academic discussion about it. But the things that we do find, like Homo erectus in Java, it, it cannot be explained that hom, hom, none of the fauna on Java originated in Java. It came from somewhere. So we have evidence that uh, the fauna on Java came from India. Now, even though we don't have Homo erectus in India, I think that's a very good po actual evidence that exists that Homo erectus lived in India. Now, on the other hand, in Java, they have no idea what kind of technology Homo erectus had. They have very little evidence of stone tools. But I think it's also quite a good inference that Homo erectus in Java must have made the similar kind of stone tools as was found in India. And there are like this one site in Java that does have some similar type of tools, the site of Nebang, which has cleavers. So anyway, uh, when we come back to India, comparing India with Africa and India with Europe, so the Echelin in India has a similar age to that in Africa and the, the Acheulean in Europe is much younger. Uh, Acheulean in Africa is also associated with Homo erectus. Now, did Homo erectus and Acheulean 
evolve in India or Africa. Right now, everybody thinks it's Africa, but that I think is mainly because they don't know about the evidence in India. It's just not taken into consideration. So uh, anyway, I've already made my point what I think that I, I do think it, it happened in India. Uh, and I think eventually people will agree with me. I'm not going to beat people over the high head. You think about it and if you agree with, I mean, I think this, it's inescapable actually the conclusion. But now the other thing is, uh, what is the importance of this Homo erectus and Eschulian? So this is one of the landmarks in human evolution. And this is the, it, it's uh, the first evidence that we have outside of Africa relates to this time period. So the, uh, there is an earlier stage of human evolution, which is related to a genus called Homo Australopithecus. And the reason that Australopithecus is probably related to us is that they were bipedal. So this bipedalism, it's not very common among mammals. Uh, it's actually unique to humans. So any fossil form that we have that was bipedal must have been very closely related to us. But the Australopithecus, although it is bipedal, it does not really have a much larger brain than present day apes. And um, tool making is only confined to one part. So you have Australopithecus, Australopithecus in South Africa and East Africa, but tools associated with Australopithecus or during the time when Australopithecus fossils are being found is only found in East Africa. The species of Australopithecus in East Africa and South Africa are always different even though they belong to the same genus. So the, the thing that people have got confused is like somewhere just around this transition which happens in Africa like um, Homo erectus appears in Africa with Eschulian at 1.8 million and that's when you start to get evidence outside of Africa also. But a lot of it is not Homo erectus and it's not Eschulian. So I think that there were probably many populations of different species of the genus Australopithecus all throughout, not only Africa, but also in Eurasia. And uh, they have, they are kind of invisible to us because they were not making stone tools. So present day apes, they do a lot of tool making, but very few of the tools are stone. So I think that you had many kind of, so I would call the Australopithecines kind of a bipedal ape, and they were making tools. So tool is part of the ape repertoire. It is not unique to Homo. And all of the Australopithecines were making tools, but only one group in East Africa was making stone tools. So the archaeological record only starts with that. But the thing uh, is that the brain is a very expensive organ. It uh, consumes 25% of what we eat goes to just feeding the brain. So we have a large brain. So um, now anthropologists are, and people who study um, you know, this, this have actually uh, found out that in fact apes don't have large brains, they have big bodies. They cannot have a big body and a big brain. So chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, they all spend seven to eight hours eating. And you can't spend more than that time eating. So they're, eat, they're, they're, they're eating raw food, fruits, this, that. But they cannot actually get more energy. So they have the largest brain that it's possible to have with their body size uh, in a wild diet completely like, like just eating wild foods. And even then they do process some of it, like the you know chimpanzees use those sticks to get termites and so on. But they're not using a lot of technology for acquiring the food. But even then, all their tool using is related to uh, getting food. So the conclusion that, I mean, is that this Homo erectus has a much larger body. And it's the beginning of the increase of brain. So this particular step from Australopithecus to Homo required a different food source. So there are so many theories. There is, you know, meat eating could have been important. 
um, you know, there's another theory called grandmothering, there's a, the fire cooking, then uh, people have talked about hunting by running, endurance running, so all of these things, there's thermal regulation, there's all of these different, um, you know, um, different things that have been used as, you know, as the thing which allowed this uh, better diet. Now the thing is that what I have been saying for the last, you know, maybe 10 years, 5 years, I don't know, is that the really unique thing about Echelian is that they carried the tools. So like when people talk about how Echelian is more advanced than older one, they always talk about shaping, that they had some desi tool design in mind. But actually this earliest Echelian does not have a lot of shaping. The tools are extremely simple. But the thing, the, the, the really unique thing is that when we come to Echelian, we never get the whole sequence of the making tools. Whereas in the older one, which is associated with Australopithecus, you get everything. So archaeologists are like, you know, so happy because they dig a five by five meter trench. You get the raw material, you get all the flakes, you get the cores, everything is in that five meter area. They say, oh, wonderful. Our site has not been disturbed by geological processes. It's a primary site. It's so wonderful. It's pristine. And uh, then they go to the Echelian and they say, oh, the cores are missing, the flakes are missing, we just have these big tools, oh everything has been messed up, this site is so bad, it's a secondary site. But I was going on like this for 20, 25 years, 25, 30 years of my 40 years in Echelian. And then one day I just said, look, how is it? All the Echelian sites are like this, all the older one sites are like this, all the Echelian sites are like this, not a single Echelian site is good, all of them are spoiled by some process. I thought, no, no, maybe it isn't like that. So I think that actually it, we call it fragmented chain operatoire. So chain operatoire is like the sequence of making the tool. So a tool, a tool is made by breaking something. So you select the raw material, you prepare it in a way that you can get the thing that you want. Then you have your tool. So what I think the archaeological record shows is that the older ones you know, I, they, 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 they did carry stuff, they did select good raw material, but they were limited to carrying in their hands. So that's why you get everything in a five meter area. Everything fits, like, you know, if you have 25 uh, scars, flake scars, like 25 pieces removed from a stone, you've got the scars, then those 20, there's about 25 in the trench. So nothing's missing, you've got all that, all that works together. But the Echelian people, Homo erectus, m made the tools, used the tools, and discarded the tools in different places. So if you actually excavate any place or collect from one place, you never get everything. You never get everything. You get only some of it. And this is, of course, there are, I mean, I think every site that's a million years old or even, every, even a site that's a few hundred years old or a few thousand years old, it's been affected by so many processes. You have to understand that. And it's not a binary thing that primary and secondary. Every site has a different story and you have to understand it. But this is part of the human behavior. Now, this is what I was saying, like this, uh, you know, fragmented chain operatoire versus complete chain operatoire. This is the difference, fundamental difference related to a significant change in human behavior between Australopithecus and Homo erectus. Now, why were they, how and why were they carrying this? I think the archaeology, it shows that they carried those tools. Did they carry them in their hand? So I don't think they carried them in their hand. They had some way of carrying it, however it was. Did they just have a skin that they wrapped it up and put it on their head? Whatever they had. Uh, did they make something out of bark? Did they have baskets? Who knows? But they definitely carried them and they definitely had some technology to make it possible to carry it. Now, did they invent that technology to carry the hand axe? No, I don't think so. The hand axe is a consequence of having the bag. It didn't produce, it wasn't the motivation to have the bag. So now what do you, what's a bag for? It's to collect things. So what would this Homo erectus be doing? So I think that the Echelian technology implies uh, a foraging, 
So using technology for a vegetarian diet. So usually uh, collecting things is not animals. Collecting things is vegetables. So the more nutritious parts of vegetables um, are, are being collected and this could make a better uh, diet. So I think this uh, transition from Australopithecus to Homo is reflected in that technology. It's related to, a, to using technology to improve the vegetarian diet, not the non-vegetarian diet. So animals, um, you know, eating meat is um, and it's a high density, um, caloric rich, a nutritional rich thing. But if they had to eat it raw, even meat might not have been so attractive. So probably cooking is part of it, collecting is definitely part of it. And all kinds of other food processing, collect pounding, uh, and just, you know, just eating only the nutritious part, like only the seed or only the nut, not eating the whole leaves and that other stuff. So this is probably uh, what has led to the, the lifting of the constraint on the brain size and body size. And this is what, why Homo erectus and Acheulean is so important.